because of that, and it's cold, out, high altitude nature, it's very good for looking at microwaves because water absorbs microwaves. This coffee can be heated up because it has water in it, in mm. addition to the vodka and whiskey that Joe That's put right. into it. Yeah. Um, it can be heated up because water vibrates at a certain frequency as stimulated by microwaves, and that causes rotational energy, converts the energy into heat, thermal energy. And that's how, so, but the lesson is water absorbs microwaves. So you'd like to be in space where there's no water if you're looking for photons from the Big Bang that have traveled for 13.8 billion years to get to your telescope, right? You don't want to get absorbed in a water molecule here in New Jersey or in San Diego even. Yeah. If you go, if you took a glass. Now, if we're just, let, let's just start with the actual claim right there. First of all, the, my even before I get to science, right, and some of like the equations you said you, your friend was making on on the moon and proving exactly where it was and what the coloration was and how the light hit and everything. Even before that, I'm like, think of every ally we have in the world, starting with Britain. There is not one country on Earth that would have not wanted to disprove that we went to the moon when we did it because it was like you know it was like a it was like a talent show competition. So if we didn't do it. Someone was going to come out and say that. That's number one. Number two, though, and this goes to where people like the Barts and, and people who will back someone like a Bart bring it up, where I'm like, there is an interesting question here. People say, like, we've had enormous exponential technology growth over time, and yet the one thing that we seem to not have exponentially grown on is going to the moon, which we did in 1969. So as a scientist, how how do you reckon with the fact that we haven't, like, prioritized really mm. doing that and exploring that as far as we know? Let me take you back really far. Um, I've been to the South Pole, Antarctica twice. It's an amazingly boring place. It makes New Jersey look like the no, no. It's it's. Oh. A, <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. I'm just kidding. I, I can't tell. I can't tell. Um, you, uh, the the South Pole is. Imagine going out into the middle of the Atlantic. Go out like four or five hundred miles. You can't see land. You can't see boats. You can't see anything. Freeze it. Paint it white. That's what the South Pole looks like. It's just mm. frozen snow. It's 9,000 feet of snow that have accumulated over millions of years of just snowfall. Every year, snow just comes down. And but it gets what, uh, what about the Nazi bases under Well, the there? pyramids. There's and the a pyramids. Py well, exactly, right. I know you're going to clip that. You're got covering got clip up that. for all this yeah, stuff pyramids. now, Ryan. That's right. I'm covering Ryan. up for big, big pharaoh. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was actually once a tropical paradise, that is for sure. Um, so uh, we went there, I've been there twice, and each time I go there, I kind of somewhat regret it. The first time you get there, it's like, ah, cool, this is great, take a selfie. Uh, and then within a couple hours, you're bored, and all you can do is work, which is the reason that we go there is because it's one of the best places on Earth to do astronomy of the kind that we do, where it's dark half the year. Sun doesn't come above the horizon from March 21st. It goes below the horizon, comes up September 21st. And because of that, and it's cold, out high altitude nature, it's very good for looking at microwaves because water absorbs microwaves. This coffee can be heated up because it has water in it, in mm. addition to the vodka and whiskey that Joe That's put into right. it. Yeah. Um, it can be heated up because water vibrates at a certain frequency as stimulated by microwaves, and that causes rotational energy, converts the energy into heat, thermal energy. And that's how, so, but the lesson is water absorbs microwaves. So you'd like to be in space where there's no water if you're looking for photons from the Big Bang that have traveled for 13.8 billion years to get to your telescope, right? You don't want to get absorbed in a water molecule here in New Jersey or in San Diego even. Yeah. If you go, if you took a glass and you extended it to space, and you said, how much water is in that glass? On a very humid day, in a very humid place, it would be almost this much water. It's about 10, 10 centimeters or so of water. Mm -hmm. It could be that high, okay, 100 millimeters of water. In San Diego, which is a desert, it's ca called a, a coastal desert, on average, it's about one centimeter. So it's maybe 10 times less than it would be in the Amazon Got jungle, it. okay? So uh, that's if you extend, and it doesn't matter how wide the glass is, you just extend it to space, it will always come up to this level. If you go to the South Pole, it's less than one third of one millimeter, 300 microns of water, condensed water above the South Pole up into space. So it's almost like being in space. But even those, you know, and it's still trillions of molecules of water, don't get me wrong, but and it's still not as nowhere near as good as being in space, but it's still much, much better. That's it's why just, we go there. It's hard to think about that, though, because yeah. you're thinking about glaciers, uh, you know, like There's no glaciers there, yeah, yeah. It's just pure ice. It's just pure, pure ice. Snow. Yeah, it's like a so, snow desert. But it's so cold. Remember when you were a kid, when I was a kid, and I lived in Westchester and Long Island, um, it would be, sometimes we'd listen to the AM radio. Oh, uh, you know, uh, Dobbs Ferry School is closed uh, because of snow days, right? Like nowadays, unfortunately, because of global warming, uh, global climate change, definitely not a hoax. Um, <laughs> the the amount of snow days you get is almost negligible here mm -hmm. uh, compared to when I was a kid. We used to get 10, you know, 10 feet of snow a year easily around here. Now you don't get it so much. But that was the greatest sound on earth when you heard like 
Shh, Dobbs Ferry, you know, school yeah, is canceled. School. It was great. Um, the reason that you don't, uh, sometimes it wouldn't, it would be so cold and there would have been snow, but the snow actually condensed out of the atmosphere uh, because the cold air holds less humidity and therefore less water and less precipitation possibility than does warm air, which is why the tropics and the places like uh, the jungle and Amazon, those are much more moist uh, yes. places, right? Um, so we go to the South Pole because it's dry. It's almost like going to space. Now, the reason that it was first discovered, you know, it wasn't discovered until 1911. December 1911. The South Pole wasn't? Nobody reached the South Pole for all of humanity's history until 1911. And then two teams of people reached it within three weeks of each other. The, the uh, Norwegian team led by this guy, Roald Amundsen, uh, who had tried to get to the North. This guy was a stud. He and his team tried to get to the North Pole first. They were beaten by some uh, team whose name I can't remember. It's, it's interesting because he's more famous for reaching the South Pole. And the North Pole is not on a continent. There's no continent underneath the North Pole, but there is a continent underneath the South Pole, Antarctica. And he immediately turned around in the middle of, so this would have been the northern, um, this would have been the northern summer, trying to, and he went and he tried to reach the South Pole and be the first person to reach the South Pole. He didn't know there was a British team, which was also trying to do it much more methodically. And they had already kind of reached Antarctica, but they were waiting their turn to get to the South Pole for waiting through the winter, which mm. is the northern hemisphere yes. summer when he failed to be the first to the North Pole. Amundsen turns around, epic guy, In the got winter. to the South Pole. He beats the British team by three weeks. Whoa. Because he used this team of dogs. So what you're looking at on screen- They're probably big mad. Is Amundsen's team. So this is the Amundsen's team uh, picture, but this is taken by, I think this uh, picture says below, uh, pictures they arrive in December, 1911. Uh, so that's uh, Roald Amundsen and his team. So this is a selfie of them at the South Pole. Okay, a they're selfie. Proving, this is a basically, yeah, it's just a picture taken by an old-fashioned camera. Yeah, they had an Insta 360. It was mm. amazing. No, um, I forget how they did it. But see that? See how like it's hard to tell in the picture, but the background's completely flat and white. So three weeks later, this British team who doesn't know this Careful team is there. Careful with that word, flat. What? Flat? Careful with that word flat okay, when we're talking earth, yeah. about poles. It looks flat. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, you know, it's true that they the Flat Earth Society has, you know, members all around the globe. Uh -huh. um, so as the British team was coming up, you can see things for about 10 miles away. They saw this flag sticking out of the ice, okay? They saw it about 10 miles before they got there. It was almost half a day. So they realized, wow, we just got screwed. Imagine like, and this would be like, yeah. and I'm going to make the analogy, Neil Armstrong stepping out of the eagle, you know, sipping on some tang, and then all of a sudden he lands and he looks down, it's a Soviet Union's flag <laughs> that he crashed on, okay? Imagine that crushing disappointment. And all the more so, because not seen in the selfie picture there, well, was about 10 sled dogs. And the reason they're not seen, they pulled them from the coast of Antarctica where they arrived by ship. The reason is because they're inside their stomach right now. They ate the dogs. They eat no. the dogs. They ate the cats. No. The no. people that live, I swear. They're eating the, eat the dogs. dogs. <laughs> They're eating the cats. <laughs> they literally... They're eating everything. <laughs> they literally ate their sled dogs. That's and fucked up. the British would not use it. So if you look up the British team, they That's didn't use sled dogs. Up. British knew that they wouldn't, they, they couldn't bear to eat their own dogs. So they didn't even bring dogs, which made it things much worse for them. Because I now, respect that. Though. Yeah. I now do. they had to carry all the food and fuel for themselves. They were also picking up meteorites and stuff like that. There's their team. So they, that's their selfie three weeks later. See, that's January 1912. So it's only three weeks different. So that would be like the Russians landed on the moon three weeks after us. Now, God, look at their skin. They're all roasted oh. because it's so sunny down there. You get sun blinded and burned. And then all those guys died. They all died in March of, of uh, 1912 because they had took too long to get there. That three-week difference was the difference between life and death. But why? Because the weather changes so fast at the South Pole as it approaches sunset, which is in the end of March, March 21st, that they are um, they got better, bitterly cold, incredibly windy. They ran out of food and fuel, and they basically Ooh. froze to death on the ice. Wow. Uh, they were about 10 miles away. They had left. They had to leave these caches, you know, C-A-C-H-E, of, of, of food and fuel and stuff, and they were only a few miles away from their final cache that would have caused them to survive. Uh, but they didn't, and then eventually the next summer, their their team was still stuck in Antarctica on the coast, a place called McMurdo, which is where we go, is uh, from the U.S. base that's there. And we uh, and they sent their team out in the next summer, like five or six months, you know, six months after they died, and collected their frozen bodies and brought oh them back to God. Britain. 
How do you even get to Antarctica? You take a ship? Well, now uh, you can take a ship. I, I wouldn't do that. I get pretty badly seasick. You can take one to like Neil deGrasse Tyson. I, I just saw him after um, he was uh, he was there over uh, Christmas break. Uh, he took a ship from Chile, a place called Puntas Arenas, which mm. is in the southern tip of Chile. Oh. Um, and you sail there, but you're really going to like barely the Antarctic. You know, it's like there's a big peninsula of Antarctica that sticks up um, north. Uh, part of it goes north of the Antarctic Circle. So it's it, in other words, it's it's lower. Um, it's it's like sixty degrees south latitude instead of sixty six degrees la south latitude, which is where the sun never sets or rises beyond a certain point. Just like the north mm -hmm. hemisphere has the same thing. So um, you can take a boat there. No scientists. Uh, the only way you can get to the South Pole is if you're a scientist or a support staff. You do carpentry, plumbing, uh, dentist. Uh, not dentistry, medical. You could be a doctor there. That's the only reason you can get to the South Pole. So you can't just go. You can't be militarily. You can't buy. A you can buy a ticket, and uh, rich guys. We're doing that once when I was there from Forbes magazine. Some guy, there's a thing where you can land at 90, at, sorry, 89 degrees south latitude. So it's one degree, which is 60 nautical miles from the south um, geographic pole. And then they ski that 60 mile leg. It's called ski the last degree. Uh, but they're not really allowed to spend much time in the station or, or like sleep there or whatever. So they get picked up by a ski plane. That's uh, that sounds miserable. Uh, so that's one of the one of the worst ways you can get there. Uh, but nowadays, no, we go from Los Angeles to uh, to Christchurch, New Zealand, uh, through Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, you fly commercially to each one of those places. And then in Christchurch, the U.S. has a base, you know, that they share supplies with the New Zealand, the mighty New Zealand Air Force, whose uh, logo is a kiwi bird, which is a flightless bird. Um, <laughs> you get on a C-130 <laughs> cargo plane and you fly there. It takes 11 hours. The first time I, t I went there uh, in 2005, uh, we attempted it. We get, They go more than halfway to, this, to the Antarctic coast from New Zealand. Uh, and that's to wait for the weather to turn around or, or if it's going to change, they don't want to have, and then they can't, they don't have enough fuel to make it back to Christchurch. So they landed in Dunedin, which is the very most Southern tip of New Zealand. Then they refuel and then come back. And it's called a boomerang. When you fly all the way out, it took 13, 14 hours to go nowhere. I just came back, woke up 530 in the morning, came back seven o'clock at night. And mm. that was, the, that was my day. Um, and then the next day we made it to the coast. From there, you take another plane. This is one of the planes like the F-22 or the B-2 that the U.S. Air Force does not allow to be exported. It's called an LC-130. So, Joey, you can look up LC-130. Oh, yeah. We've had it's guys talk plane. about that. It's a plane. Yeah, it's a really yeah. cool plane. It's flown by New York Air National Guard. My, my homie's up there in New York. Hey, guys, if you haven't already subscribed, please hit that subscribe button. It's a huge, huge help. Thank you. It's one of the few planes that's not uh, exportable by law to any other country because it's too valuable strategically. So you get on that, and it's um, and it's it's operated by the National Science Foundation and the New York Air National Guard, um, and they operate six flights a day at the south to the South Pole from the coast of McMurdo, which is where six we flights up. a day, six flights a day except for Sunday. Yeah. Well, oh, the other cool thing that they do: this plane has enough fuel for about ten hours of flight time. It's only three hours to get to the South Pole. But the South Pole runs on JP-11, which is the type of jet fuel that these planes run on. They use the jet fuel. They pump it off the jet, off the turboprop. They pump it into a storage container, and they use that to power the station. So they use a diesel generator. Diesel is basically like jet fuel. That's kerosene, very similar to it. Mm. That's how all the electricity is powered. So the plane flies up. Let's say it's got three-thirds. It's got 100% of its fuel. It takes off from McMurdo, flies to the South Pole. That took three hours of its of its capacity. Then they pump off about two or three hours of its remaining capacity, leaving about four hours left maximum. Then it flies back with three hours, lands with one hour. So you know, uh, what it's doing is it's using it as a basically one of the jerry cans. So these planes, that's why you need it so many times a day. Plus, there's a lot of people that come in and out during the summer. During the winter, no one flies. You can't fly because the fuel would freeze. Yeah. And the plane gets destroyed. It's a $100 million aircraft. That's pretty rare. So they don't fly it. Uh, so you can't get in or out. There are people that have been rescued, you know, but only after a long period of time. It was a very dangerous operation. They had to hire commercial pilots. There was one time that happened in the past 50 years. But the, why did I bring this up, Julian? Are you worried about this tangent that I've been on for the last 10 minutes? I love your tangents because they got good stories to them. Well, i got to the let you weave. Great. Yeah. So you asked me, well, isn't it kind of suspicious that the U.S. didn't go back? Well, I have an example of why this is not unusual at all. The second team to get to the South Pole occurred in 1912, as I said. The, the British team led by uh, Robert Falcon Scott. 
they all died. Uh, the next people to get there was in 1956, yeah. something called the an An Antarctic Treaty. Now, before that, that was a continent. No one had ever been to that place on the entire yeah. continent. That was a huge thing. I mean, there weren't many things that were undiscovered on Earth and unexplored by human beings, even in 1912, 1911. It was like the last blank spot on the map, so to speak. But that's also that's also that we know of. Well, you mean it was like until secret 19... place? Or... Sure. Like... I mean, there are places that haven't been climbed or some mountains. Yeah, are, like, were, you know. but were there expeditions that were made there that, you know, just but weren't then, talked about? But it's no not one... like we had cameras down there saying, oh, we got got them on security feed. Um, there's still probably some place that no human being, I mean, I'm sure there's places you've been that, you know, very few of them, maybe no people have. I mean, I felt like that when I was at the South Pole, you know, for sure. I was like, uh, did anyone ever go to this exact square inch of the South? But is that really what matters? I mean, it's kind of sort of like the South Pole is important because it's, it's geographic important to the earth there's only two poles on earth and only one of them has a continent yeah. underneath it right so you can build a base there that won't melt away on an iceberg the next year thank you guys for checking out this clip if you haven't already subscribed please subscribe and hit the like button on this video it is a huge huge help and if you'd like to check out this clip's full podcast episode that link is in the description below or right here and finally you can follow me on instagram and x by using the links in my description below